want to welcome you to this worship service. I think you're going to really get a blessing out of the music you're going to hear today and the presentations that are given, and hopefully the message will be a blessing to you as well. I know that right now it's tough on us all because we can't meet, we can't congregate, but that won't last too much longer. I understand that very soon they're going to relax all the restrictions, and hopefully in the next several weeks we'll be able to meet again as a congregation. We may not be able to shake hands or hug each other or touch each other, but we can meet and we can preach, sing, and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as we feel like we're able to do that, we will let you know, we will give you the date when we will start that. So remember to pray for us. Keep praying for us because we are praying for you every single day. Thank you for hanging in there and have a great day. Good morning, church. Welcome to another great day of worship as we serve our Lord and Savior today. Let's join our hearts. Let's join our voices together. How about stand wherever you are this morning and let's sing this great song of praise. Oh, who can stop? 
said, Amen. Good morning, Monument Kids. I hope you guys are all doing well and that you are staying safe and healthy. I have a quick question for you this morning. How many of you have a diary or a journal at home? Um, that's a place where you write things down that you want to keep totally hidden from other people. Let's say your brother or your sister or your cousins, or maybe you like to pass secret messages to your friends. Today, I'm going to show you how to make invisible ink. So parents, if you would like to do this at home, all that you need is a lemon, some water, a sheet of paper, and a flashlight. So what you do is you just put the juice of one lemon inside your bowl with a couple of splashes of water, and you are just going to dip your finger in, or a small paintbrush if you like, and right on your paper and then a heart. Can you guys see it? Perfect. Sometimes we want privacy when we write something, but today we're going to talk about a book that needs no privacy. It should be read everywhere all of the time by everyone. It's a book that is very, very old. Do you guys know what that book is? Yeah. Bible. Good job, kids. It's the Bible. Do you know how old the Bible is? It is 2,700 years old. That's more years than we've even been counting forward, so that's pretty cool. Now, would you like to hear some fun facts about the Bible? All right, here we go. For example, did you know that the Bible has sold more copies than any book in the history of the world. In fact, it has sold about five billion copies. That is a lot. That makes the Bible the best-selling book of all time, out of all the books that have ever been written. And did you know that if you took all of those Bibles and stacked them up, that it would reach the moon almost three times? And also, if you were to lay the Bibles out flat and wrap them around the earth, they would wrap around over 28 and a half times. That is pretty cool. All right. So some more cool things about the Bible. It is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the trick to telling them apart is that the Old Testament tells us about God's people before Jesus and the New Testament basically starts at Jesus' birth and tells us everything from that point forward, everything about Jesus and the things that are to come. Now, both the Old Testament and the New Testament are divided into smaller books. Do you guys know how many? 66. That's 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Are you guys ready for some more fun facts? Here we go. There are actually... 31,102 verses in the Bible. That is 23,145 in the Old Testament and 7,957 in the New Testament. That is more than 780,000 words. And uh, that is actually well over 3 million letters. Whew, that's a lot. The Bible was written by more than 40 authors, including a priest, a king, a general, a cupbearer, a minister, a physician, a fisherman, a tax collector, and more. And it was written in many different places, places like the wilderness, in a palace, in prison, and in exile. And it was written in multiple languages, and it was translated into 636 different languages. You guys, it's even been translated into emoji. Did you know that? That's a lot of information to take in, isn't it? I want to tell you one more fact about the Bible, and it's the most important one, and that is that God is the author of the Bible. Within the pages of the Bible is the information that he wants us to have on how we should live. He used regular people to write down his words. 
For example, in Exodus 24, 4, it says that Moses wrote down everything that the Lord had said. The Bible is a guidebook for us. It has all the information that we need to know on how to live life, on what happens next, and about how to get into heaven. That is some pretty cool information. Now, before we move on back into worship, I have a special guest that's going to come on up here and pray with us. So come on up. This is Emma. Emma is going to pray for us today. So you guys at home, go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. God, thank you for just saying just all of us have a great day today. And thank you for the word you have given us. And please protect everyone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, guys. I'll see you next week. Our aim of worship today is crown him with many crowns. Wherever you are this morning, let's stand and worship our Heavenly Father. It's so good to be with you this Sunday morning. You know, this past week, Sam Carter, our amazing children's minister, and I were talking. She was sharing with me what uh, what her lesson was going to be on, and then um, we both decided to piggyback off of each other. Actually, I'm piggybacking off of her since you just heard her. I'd like to share with you some truth about the Bible and God as well. I'd like to talk with you this morning about CODA. CODA, you might ask, Pastor Gary, what in the world is CODA? Well, I'm glad you asked. CODA is creation, order, 
design, and archaeology. It's a way that helps you um, remember and helps you to share the reality and the factual basis that God is real. C, CODA, C. C stands for creation. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, we read very clearly that in the beginning, God created. We know God created. We can see with our own eyes that there's a creation. Also, did you know in the first chapter of Romans, verse 20, the Bible says this, that we can see God's invisible qualities, his power and attributes because of what can clearly be seen. Man and woman are without excuse. You know, it's so obvious the things that we see, people, animals, birds, cats, dogs, fish. We see the birds of the air, the animals of the land. We see the sun, the moon, the stars. And because of that, we know there has to be a creator. Folks, we're in a beautiful church. If there's a building, you had a builder. If you see a painting, you know there was a painting. So simple logic says if you have a creation, you had a creator. Also, I'd like to share with you this fact. Cultures at the beginning of humanity existing on this planet, cultures from around the planet were making sacrificial altars. They were making sacrifices, paying homage to something. What do you think that something was? Well, because they were just like you and me, they were seeing everything around them and they knew there must be a creator and we should give some love to the creator. And so we believe that the people early on were making sacrifices to show their amazing love and belief in God. So C is for creation. The O, coda, the O is for order. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, actually from verse 30 to 40, first Corinthians 14, 30 to 40 says, we do not serve a God of chaos and confusion. No, we serve a God of specific order. Let me give you some examples of that specific order. For instance, the earth is at a perfect distance to the sun. Any closer, we burn up. Any further away, we freeze. Perfect, that's what you call specific order. Did you know the earth also is a perfect distance to the moon? If we were any closer or any further away from the moon, we would be overtaken by tidal surges multiple times a day. I would call that specific order. Did you know also to think about this, that the earth is rotating at a perfect speed that gives us 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. Too much sunlight, things can't handle it, no life. Not enough sunlight, things can't handle it, no life. Very specific order. So we have coda, creation, order, then we have D, design. Let me tell you about design. Just think about the greatest piece of machinery God has ever created, the human body. You think about the body, the heart beeping 40 to 60 beats a minute, 3,600 beats an hour. The ear, we can hear distances far away, high pitches, low pitches. The eye has over 100 million sensory lobes in it, both eyes. Quite amazing imagery that we get from these. The tongue, we can taste, we can smell. The body's amazing. But did you also know that as far out in the cosmos that we can go in space, the space, NASA's Space Hubble Telescope took an image in the furthest galaxy from Earth. It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy. You can look it up yourself online, the Whirlpool Galaxy. In the center of this galaxy, the furthest galaxy away from Earth, in the very center of the galaxy, you find an amazing image. The image is of a cross. As far out as we can go, people, we find the cross. Then bringing it back in, bringing it home to Earth, coming into the human body, to the depths of the human body, we find something called laminin. Laminin also can be looked up online if you'd like to do that. Laminin. Laminin is a molecular cell structure that holds the body skin together. Basically keeps us together. And what you find under a telescope in the depths of a human body is laminin. And the image that you have is that of a cross. As far out as we can go, 
and as far in as we can be, we find the cross. That's quite amazing. That's quite a design. That's work of an intelligent designer. Finally, A, archaeology. Did you know Luke 19 tells us that if the church were to be silenced, that even the rocks would cry out. If we don't speak on God's behalf, the earth would. That's amazing. 250,000 dig sites around the world and not a single artifact has been unearthed or found that contradicts the word of God, the Bible. And contrary to that, we have tens and hundreds of thousands of artifacts that have been discovered and unearthed that support and substantiate the claim of Christianity. The people and the places in the Bible are real places and we have the archeology span to prove it. So, Sam talked about the reality and truthfulness of the Bible. I wanted to tell you about the, the truth of the reality of God. God is real. He's as far out as we can go and he's as in deep as we can be. If you don't know God, I pray that you pray that today that you come to know him. Not just any God, but God, Jesus, the Savior, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the one that died and gave himself for you and for me and rose from the dead, defeating death. If you don't know Jesus yet, I pray that you do before this day ends. Ask him into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to be the Lord of your life. We love you, we thank you, and I'll talk to you very soon. God bless. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 tells us, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's worship together.
today is entitled Living the Christian Life. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Sounds simple. But I think anybody that's ever lived the Christian life has found that it's not easy to live for Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I suppose I've read that verse a thousand times, but it took me years of study to really understand what Paul was saying. So today, I wanna to make sure that you also understand what it means to live the Christian life. But until you do understand what the apostle is telling us, you will be a Christian living your own life. And the result will always be defeat after defeat after defeat. Of course, living the Christian life involves many things. It involves singing hymns. Psalms 89, one says, sing of the Lord's great love. But singing God's praises is only a part of living the Christian life. It involves reading God's word. Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But Bible study, as important as it is, is only a fraction of living the Christian life. Living the Christian life means going to church. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not neglect to assemble yourselves together. But communal worship is just one slice of living the Christian life. Living for Christ means giving. Jesus said that you and I are to give. He says you should do this. But sharing our financial resources is only a portion of the victorious Christian life. It involves witnessing, but as important as it is to be a walking testimony for Christ, because our Lord said, go into the world and share the gospel, but as important as it is to be a walking testimony for our Lord, being a witness is a skill that very few Christians ever use. No, the truth is you may not be able to sing, if you are like me, you don't know a sharp from a flat. You may not be able to read God's word. Several weeks ago, a man came into Gary's office and Pastor Gary sat down with him. He offered the man the plan of salvation and the man accepted Christ. Then Gary gave him or started to give him a Bible and a puzzled look came over the man's face. He said, Pastor, I appreciate the Bible 
but I do not know how to read. Also, you may not be able to go to church. Our worship services are shut down now. Hopefully, we will be starting again soon, but right now, we're not able to meet as a congregation. You may not be able to give financially. There are people in our congregation who we must help because they have hit rock bottom. But despite all that, you can still live the Christian life every day, wherever you are. Not some days, not a few days, not certain days, but every day that God gives you to breathe. Romans 6, 4 tells us this, like Christ was raised from the dead by the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Now folks, you can't always know what to pray for. Sometimes when I get ready to pray, the words just don't come out. And I have to count on the Holy Spirit to do the praying for me, as the Bible says. You can't always know God's will in everything you do. And when that situation arises, you stay where you are, according to 1 Corinthians. And you can't always understand everything you read in the Bible. But you can always, always live the Christian life. Whether you're on the job, whether you're at home, whether you're in the hospital, whether you're at a PTA meeting, or whether you're shopping for groceries. Remember, every day, where you are, under every circumstance, you can live the Christian life. Now, a majority of the time, the lives that you impact most will be the lives around you. And by that, I mean that you will impact your family, you'll impact your neighbors, you'll impact your friends, and certainly you will impact the people you work with. Of course, you can touch someone's life in other places. You can touch someone's life when you're in the line at the grocery store. Or you can touch someone's life by driving courteously on the freeway. Or you can help someone by mowing their lawn when they're incapacitated. Or you can touch someone's life by helping a stranded motorist. So there are many ways that as a Christian, you can touch the lives of others. But most of the time, most of the time, your real impact will be on the people who know you, the people that you associate with, the people who watch you every day, the people who hear your words. You know, among my papers, I have a tribute. Really, I call it a little poem. It was written by one of our members. Her name is Sis Lee. It's about the impact that another Christian had on Sis's life. The other Christian, the other member, was... Bonnie Miller. Bonnie Miller died in a tragic automobile accident in 1996, but she touched many lives by her Christian walk. Listen to Sis's tribute. It's entitled Whirlwind. A whirlwind passed into my sight one day. A swirling, powerful motion surrounded me, a presence with incredible beauty and soul. Swooping down, she touched me with the power of her song, calming, becoming a gentle breeze to carry me along, all the while waiting on God to guide her. Too soon, on the wings of clouds, this whirlwind was carried to God's throne and the peace that is there. Bonnie Miller made her living writing jingles or songs for companies. She called me one day and she said, Pastor, I've been asked to write a jingle or song for a very prominent nightclub. But she said, I don't think I should do that, even though I need the money and could use the money. I don't think that the Lord would want me to write a jingle for a company that invites people in where their lives will be ruined, where their marriages will be destroyed, where things will never be right. And so she refused to write that song. Why did she take such a stand? It was because Bonnie lived the Christian life every day, not just on Sunday. Bonnie lived the Christian life in every area of her daily walk. Folks, my goal as your pastor, as a Christian, is to live the Christian life every day. I want you to live for Christ too. Of course, there are many excuses for not living the Christian life, you say, Pastor, you just don't know how tough it is. No one could live for Christ at my home, you say. 
my family are not Christians and they look down on Christians and make fun of Christians. It's tough living for Christ in my family. Or you may say nobody could live for Christ working on the job where I work. It's really tough, Pastor. Now, I think you're right about that. Living the Christian life is tough. Jesus recognized how hard it is. In Matthew 13, 21, our Lord said this, tribulation arises because of the word. Then in John 1, 1, we are told Jesus is the word. So yes, if you live the life Jesus wants you to live, it will be tough. And the going will be rough because you see the name of Jesus brings opposition. It always has and it always will. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, Paul closes his letter to the Christians at Philippi with what I think are some amazing words. Listen to what he wrote. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are in Caesar's household. The book translation has this. All the other Christians here send their greetings to you, especially those who work in Caesar's palace. Did you realize that Paul wrote that? He wrote those words when he was in prison, when he was in jail. Imagine Christians living in Caesar's palace. Now that doesn't mean much until you realize who the Caesar was. His name was Nero. He was the last of the Caesars and he was the very worst. He was an avowed homosexual who hated the church, but he had fantastic natural abilities. He was an accomplished singer and actor. He was a world-class violinist. He won 1,808 trophies in music contests throughout the empire. And yet, his crimes were some of the most heinous crimes ever committed by a Roman ruler. He poisoned his brother Britannicus. He married a woman by the name of Octavia for show and then divorced her, exiled her from Rome, and then had her murdered. He murdered his aged mother. He built a ship, sent her on a cruise in the Mediterranean, and then had the ship sunk, thinking his mother would die. But she managed to get to land, so he sent his soldiers to murder her. He had a mistress by the name of Papia, who was pregnant with his second child, and in a fit of rage, he kicked her to death. Nero led a gang of teenagers. They would roam the streets, uh, of the city of Rome at night. They would beat people just for fun. They would abduct girls and rape young women. They would commit horrible crimes. Some of the early church fathers called Nero the beast. At the age of 31, the Praetorian Guard deserted, and as Nero heard the mobs in the streets coming for him, he paid his servant to stab him in the neck. His last words were these, the world will never know what a talent they have lost until I'm gone. And yet listen to Paul's words to the church at Philippi. He says, all the other Christians send their greetings to you, especially those who are in Caesar's palace. So don't say, Pastor, you just don't know how difficult it is for me to live the Christian life. But here's the question. It's the all important question. What does it mean to live the Christian life? Does it mean you carry a Bible all the time? Does it mean you corner people in the halls, roll your eyes and say, brother, are you saved? Does it mean you rebuke people around you who are not living the right kind of life? No, it doesn't mean any of those things. Living the Christian life is not about those things. But there are some th things that living the Christian life does mean. I want to share three very important things that you must remember as you live the Christian life. Before we get to those three things, though, there is an important verb that I want you to remember. It's the Greek verb phulake. It's translated watch or to guard. It's used over and over by Jesus. It's used by Paul. It's used by other writers in the New Testament. Jesus uses it in Matthew 24, 42, when he says, Be on guard, Fulake, for you know not when your Lord comes. He uses it again in Matthew 26, 41. He says, Be on guard, Fulake, 
and pray that you enter not into temptation. Paul uses it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, when he says, let us keep guard, fulake, and be serious. He uses it in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, be on guard, fulake, in all things and endure affliction. And John uses it in the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, when the Lord says, hold fast to your faith, always be on fulake, or guard. So let me share three things with you that you must guard if you are going to live the Christian life. First, you must guard your temper. Proverbs 51, 15, 15, 15, 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. You know, I don't think any angry person, and by that I mean somebody who is easily provoked, somebody who cannot control their temper, I don't think any angry person can ever live the victorious Christian life. Just because you are a Christian doesn't mean you are living the Christian life. There are many Christians who never do live the Christian life. Your uncontrollable temper will be remembered long, long after you have forgotten it. Others will remember it long after you have forgotten it. You know, when I was a child, I got many spankings from my mother. I deserved every single one of those, and today I can't remember any of them. The only discipline I can remember is the day my mother lost her temper and disciplined me severely for something I did not do and did not deserve. My mom died at the age of 74. She didn't remember that day, but I did, and I always will. Why? Because my mother lost her temper. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you along with all malice. Now I realize that sometimes anger is a necessary emotion. I call it righteous anger. Martin Luther wrote this, I never work better than when I'm inspired by anger. When I'm angry, I can write and pray and preach better. For then my whole temperament is quickened, my understanding sharpened, and the mundane things of life seem unimportant. Folks, there are times when we should be angry. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and sin not. We should be angry whenever we see injustice. We should be angry when we see the strong hurting the weak. We should be angry when we see someone who is being mistreated. The Bible indicates that Jesus was filled with anger whenever he ran the money changers from the temple. But the fact remains, if you are going to live the Christian life, you have to guard your temper. Secondly, you must guard your speech. There are two kinds of speech that we have to watch out for in our daily lives. The first is what I call religious speech. That's the speech where every other word is something like praise God or hallelujah or thank you, Jesus. Now, those are great phrases, no doubt about it. And used in the right circumstances, they really do honor the Lord. But we must not let those phrases become common and meaningless as we use them in everyday speech without any meaning whatsoever or without any context. I've been around people who couldn't carry on a rational conversation without religious speech. The other kind of speech I call secular speech. It involves profanities, obscenities, and what I call vulgarisms, such as saying, good God, or Jesus Christ. There are men and women who cannot carry on a conversation without every other word being a profanity or an obscenity or a vulgarism. You can always tell what a person is, what's in a Christian's brain by the words that come out of that Christian's mouth. One writer put it like this. I lost a very little word only the other day. It was a very nasty word I really had not meant to say. But then it was not really lost as from my lips it flew. My little son picked it up and now he says it too. You see, what you say, the words you use, how you express yourself 
That may not tell you anything about me, but those words tell me a lot about you. The third thing you must guard are your actions. Remember folks, if you love others, you may have to set aside some legitimate activities. In 1 Corinthians chapter eight, Paul says, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I will eat no meat. You know what he means by that? In Corinth, the only place you could buy fresh, good meat was at a pagan temple meat market. The meat had been sacrificed at Apollo's temple and then it was sold in the meat market. There were some very weak Christians who said, we cannot believe a Christian should eat that meat because it brings reproach on Jesus and it encourages paganism. Paul said, they don't realize that meat is just meat. It's food. No matter what is done with it, it's still food. But he says, I don't want to cause my brother or my sister who is weak to stumble and fall. And so I will not eat meat if it causes someone to be offended. A modern illustration would be maybe playing card games. Now I see nothing wrong with playing games with cards or dice, but some Christians I know are weak in the faith. They think playing cards is a sin. So when I'm around them, I don't suggest that we play spades or hearts or rummy wine because I don't want to offend them. I don't want to hurt them. Paul still ate meat and I still play card games, but not when it will hurt a weak Christian. So sometimes we do have to be careful and set aside activities that are legitimate, but weaker Christians don't understand that. According to the Bible, Sardis was a great city in the ancient world. It had multitudinous temples. It had vice and corruption everywhere. It was the Las Vegas of its day. The Lord Jesus Christ says, you have a few names in Sardis. They have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white. So folks, guard your actions. What you do speaks louder than what you say. Remember this, the only Jesus your friends and your family will ever see is the Jesus they see in you. So remember Paul's words in Romans chapter 12, verse two. He wrote, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for your life which is good and pleasing and always perfect. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you have never accepted Christ, I invite you right now to say, Lord, I trust you as my savior. I want you as my Lord. I accept what you did for me on the cross. Our heavenly father, as we close this service this morning, we just pray you'll use everything that's been sung and said and preached, everything, every effort that's been put forward, we pray you will use it to lift up Jesus, to touch our hearts. We ask this in our Lord's name, amen.